The presenting sponsor for On Education is Classcraft. The school year is winding down and Classcraft is here to help teachers continue to make their classes relevant and meaningful. During the month of May, all new or existing Classcraft Premium users can get their summer subscription for free. That's 14 months for the price of 12. To take advantage of this deal and continue to inspire your students, simply visit classcraft.com slash oneducation. Yeah, I mean, if you watch a teenager work on Snapchat and you watch their thumbs move, you 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 go, whoa, what, what's going on here? I, I don't get this at all. Um, but then you ask them to turn something in on Google Drive, and then they play dumb, and they're like, I don't, I don't know how to do it. I swear I turned it in. Right? <laughs> so- <laughs> Welcome to On Education. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We will discuss the accessibility that esports has given students, whether we need to rethink the time schedule of the school day, Minecraft's 10th anniversary, and our returning guest this week is Nate Green, and he's here to chat about the power of using social media in your classrooms. So we took a week off. Yes, we did. For Mother's Day, which I think it it was weird. Um... It was nice not having to schedule our whole my whole day around this. Um, so like we were almost we were out almost on purpose at one o'clock on Sunday just because we could, and we never can. So it was weird. It was a whole weird experience. Yeah, no, it was a fantastic Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to my mom and yes, yes, and to your mom. Um, yeah, it was. It, it's so weird how we get into the groove of Sunday actually being the day where we. It's a work day. It's a very much a work day from more, <laughs> early morning for you until yeah. uh, until we actually get this recording done, and then uh, then the, even the editing then the afternoon, you know. So it's a it's a yeah. day. So to not actually work or do that kind of felt awkward, but it was great so that yeah. we could spend yeah. our day with our wives and our and then uh, our moms too. So it's a it's a long weekend here. Uh, it's Victoria Day weekend. Victoria Day. Uh-huh. Awesome. <laughs> That's something. So this new. is a very this is a very <laughs> Canada weekend. Okay. Uh, Victoria Day weekend is always a, there. There's actually a nickname for it. It's it's tends to be called the May two four weekend. Okay. Because uh, it it's usually like the third it's the third weekend in May I think. Um. So it, it kind of falls somewhere around the twenty fourth, but. The two four is actually related to like beer, like twenty four beers in a case. Oh, so it's it's I don't know how. <laughs> so it's a that, heavy drinking weekend. <laughs> it is definitely a drinking weekend. Um, it's I I wrote on Twitter that it's pool opening weekend. Yeah, I saw those um, pictures. A lot it's beautiful. of a, a lot of people open open up their pools on this weekend. Uh, our neighbors have a pool which you can actually see in that picture. They opened up theirs this weekend, and the folks across the road did theirs. And it's funny. Um, Barry in particular is funny like this, and I'm sure a lot of other places in Canada are like this, but uh, I mean, we tend to hibernate in the winter. Everyone's just like, you you know, you go home, you go to work, you go home, you go to work. Yes. It's actually, actually, this is something we have in common, our climate, right? For sure. We're the same, man. you, You probably get this a little bit. And then it's like, it's like yesterday afternoon when it was beautiful, everybody was outside doing stuff around the house and cleaning up their gardens and opening pools. And it's like, I haven't seen you in like six months, but, you know, <laughs> you know hi again. Hey, uh, I didn't even know right, you lived here. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. So it's like everyone is out. Everyone was doing stuff. Uh, we're, we're filling the pool uh, today with water so that we can uh, we can get it heated up and... Um, we won't be able to use it for a couple of weeks, but hey, well, it's happening. It's yes. happening. And it's finally that time of year. It's exciting. Actually, next week is graduation for our our seniors, and graduations are already been happening the last few weeks in different schools right. throughout Minnesota and throughout the country. So this is the time of year where it's like, oh, we're we're headed towards the end, baby. <laughs> when is school o- when is school over there for us? For it, you, for uh, you, the last day for students is right before June. Um, So I still have to go, I think, the first week of June for a few days because we had some snow days because otherwise I wouldn't have uh, had to go back. Um, So let's say it's the third and fourth for teachers. Uh, The students get out the 30th, 29th, somewhere in there. Um, 
And so, and most schools in Minnesota end right around that that time of year. Uh, the, hmm. the previous school that I was at was mid May that you actually got out because we started in mid August uh, and then ended in mid May. I know that a lot of schools throughout the country. One of the things that Corey Graham likes to put out both on Facebook and Twitter is when is your last day so that we stop complaining about stuff because a lot of people like you used to have to go through second or third week of June. You know, and so all the way through June. Yeah. Yeah. The last, the the last day, the last day of school in almost all of Canada is the last weekday in June. Wow. See, that's crazy for us because usually it's right at the beginning of like June basically signifies that's the beginning of summer. And then for teachers, usually to go back to school, you have usually typically you would go the week before Labor Day uh, Uh is our workshop week. And then the week uh, after Labor Day, we usually start school on a Tuesday. You know, that's a very uh-huh. typical uh, thing throughout the country. Though some people have different things. You know, when I was out west, we started in mid-August. So uh, just depending on that. But that's crazy. End of June. Whew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so so we got to we gotta put this in, in, in the show. Today is the final day. This Eight is years. it. It's the final day, uh, final episode of Game of Thrones is tonight. I'm depressed. So when this comes when this comes <laughs> out, it'll already have happened. Yes. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna I'm giving like we're doing final predictions. Who wants to go first? You want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, I give it to me. I'm hoping that Arya and Sansa have some sort of uh, like they are the ones that are you know like. Uh, Sansa is on the Iron Throne, and Arya okay. is kind of like you know her protector or some of some sort. That's what I'm hoping, but mm-hmm. I'm afraid that it's going to be a typical Game of Thrones type of ending uh, where it's going to surprise us. So that's my prediction and hope. What do you think? So I totally think Daenerys dies. Oh, she's going to get killed by Arya. Oh. So Ari is going to kill Daenerys. I think that there is, uh, this is like the shot in the dark. I think that there's a possibility that John dies too. Ooh. I think it's possible that John and Grey Worm have a battle like over Daenerys and, and John and Grey Worm is obviously defending Daenerys and, 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 and they kill each other like, you know, in a fight sort of, sort of thing. And then, I think that it's possible. I think similar to you that it ends with Westeros being ruled by some sort of a council or a democracy of some sort. Maybe not like a monarchy, like a an absolute monarchy, but maybe um like a an Arya Sansa um with you know a little Brienne in there as like the the king's guard oh, or yeah, whatever yeah. and then the, the and then uh with um you know, a ruling council, so to speak, uh, running Westeros at the end. So, uh, but we'll see. Yes. I think, I think definitely Arya kills Daenerys. Okay. That is like, that, that'll that be is, a great that scene to happen. And we'll see if it actually does have the, the other part that I was thinking about is what I bet HBO is very depressed tonight too, because tomorrow all of us <laughs> are going to cancel our HBO subscriptions. <laughs> so many of us just get, get uh hbo just specifically for the time that game of thrones on and really it was only on for six episodes so six weeks two months of subscription Damn, yeah that's got to be brutal for them too i don't know what's uh well there's this chernobyl thing on hbo right now that i'm yes. gonna i'm gonna watch because it looks super interesting and deadwood uh, so the they... movie is coming out at the end of the month so that's interesting right? to me too yes and uh west west world is Westworld coming back? Season three? I think so. Okay. I think so. Well, they have so we'll some see. stuff. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll see. We have uh, a really cool episode next week that we want to kind of put everyone, uh, put it on everyone's radar. We're going to do a, basically like an all VR AR episode. Hopefully, uh, even um, uh, we're we're gonna have Noah back for Dig It or Ditch It. Oh, baby! And 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 hopefully it's going to be we've cha- we've put out the challenge to Noah to do an AR VR themed Dig It or Ditch It as well. Uh, and we have um, Jamie Donnelly and Kevin and I'm gonna screw up his last name. Do you know how to say his last name? Kaja. Sure. Kaja. 
Sir. <laughs> I think that that's how you say I it. Think that's probably I, right. Hopefully, hopefully he doesn't kill me if I screwed it up. But <laughs> Kevin is the creator of the Moment uh, Moment AR app that's on Merge Cube. Um, that's really really cool. So uh, Kevin and Jamie are going to be on together. And we're going to have Fantastic. a grand old time talking about AR and VR in education, all the things that are going on in that world, which is probably one of the most exciting spaces right now uh, in education. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to talk about devices. I think we might even throw some opinions on 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 the good devices out there that you should be looking into uh, some of the apps, some of the programs, some of the games uh, we're going to cover as much as we possibly can. The whole show. Nice. AR, VR, AR, all VR, AR. Baby. Augmented reality and virtual reality. We're ready. That's, <laughs> damn. So, so that's pretty exciting. There's a couple articles we want to put on people's radar as well. Uh, things. So much has happened the last two weeks. So since many we've different been, things. Uh, we've been away, but um, you know we only have time for so many. So we picked a couple here. But there's a really cool article about video games as an equity piece yes. and we've talked about this so many times in a lot of other ways never i don't think we've ever specifically framed it like this though that video games aren't just an equity piece for like we've it's it's typically framed as the equalizer for engagement where you have kids that aren't into sports and aren't into football and basketball and now you have this competitive environment for those types of kids too um which is super valuable and and you know a big reason to be into esports in education but this is related to people with disabilities yes. right yeah and i mean what a if you ever you know want to click on show notes this is an article you want to read it's a really powerful article uh, about a student that has um, a disability and basically how games, in this case the video games, basically let her be part of a community that she would have otherwise not been able to be a part of. Right. And it's super powerful, super amazing. And if there was ever a reason for you, you know, like people that are against, you know, the whole concept of video games or, or using them as, as, as something like, like what we talk about as far as an esports or something in school for game based learning, read this article, man. I think it'll really, really change your mind about the accessibility piece for these, especially specifically about these students with disabilities. But then it brings to light all of the other things that we talk about too, Mike. Uh, the, the equity between uh, male and female students, uh, mm -hmm. the the ability to go ahead and say, hey, I can participate in something and be part of the school culture, uh, but I may not have you know a physically gifted athletic ability, which a lot of people forget about that. It shouldn't just be you know the Spartans, the people that are the physically gifted people that get to go ahead and have the limelight uh, as far as in the school. That's why I love things like esports, things like robotics competitions, uh, speech, uh, debate, those types of things, theater, where it allows students to be part of a school culture, still be able to buy in, become part of a group, a guild, and then be able to go ahead and, and, and really feel like they are part of the school. So it doesn't have to just be within the athletics field. I don't think people realize that Microsoft makes an adaptive controller as well. It's it's one of the things that's super highlighted in this article, which is why we're going to put it in the show notes. I don't even think a lot of people know that this thing exists, yes. and it's it's a game changer for people. It, it, it so like if you are working in a school and you have any types of game based learning, uh, or even if you're at home and you have a, a child that that ha that needs help or isn't fully able-bodied you should be taking a look at this controller because man oh man it's not expensive it's it's a hundred dollars which is about the same price as any other kind of game controller they're they're in between 60 and 100 bucks yes they are uh, at least they they're close to that canadian anyways um it, this is an amazing device and it, it opens up so many doors for people um so check out this article and and definitely if you're one of uh one of those uh people that this applies to where this controller might be interesting you should take a look at that as well absolutely man we'll put that article in the show notes um another interesting article about school time and and the way that school days are divided up um which is a really you know fun topic to talk about because it's kind of one of those 
pie in the sky you know if we could do this thing you know what would we do yes because it's 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 kind of an immovable object um like changing the school year would be and stuff (laughs) like that um but lots of good thoughts here on what what would you do if you were changing the amount of hours in the day or what hours you actually did school at right So a couple really powerful takeaways that I had from this article are, number one, that if we want academic performances to improve for our students, we got to give them recess. It even says in this article, give them freaking recess. (laughs) Um, And it's not, I think, not just elementary school students. So often our middle and high school students need a break, especially in the afternoons. I can just see it in their faces. And yet we make sure that we crunch through the entire school day, give them no breaks. A lot of the classes, they're sitting all day long, and it's just not going to be the ideal circumstances to be able to learn. And then secondly was just the concept that we've talked about before is starting the high school day later. And here it actually starts, it says to make sure that you start no later than 8.30 a.m. We currently at uh, my school, we start at 8.20, but I know that lots of secondary schools in the United States start in the 7 o'clock type of range. It is just too early for them. Uh, it's the research shows you it's just too early to go ahead and begin the day. You got to figure your other stuff out, even if uh, you have to move athletics and do some different adjustments with them. Because uh, I think a lot of times athletics in our schools in the United States drive the reason why we want it in the school day at 3 because then we have limited amount of gym space. So we want our students to be home at a reasonable time, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. And if we keep pushing the day out, that's kind of impossible. So it's things to go ahead and take a look at, like you said, uh, what, what one of those pie in the sky kind of things. But for sure, yeah. even our administrators that listen to the show really thinking about, about hey, can we make changes in this to make sure that uh, our schedule fits the research, not that we're just trying to pigeonhole our kids into schedules that fit with our schedules. So when we come back, if you thought Minecraft was big, I don't think you've seen anything yet. We're going to go over the flurry of activity we've seen the last few weeks surrounding the biggest game on the planet on the heels of their 10th anniversary. Stay with us. Do you have plans to attend the ISTE conference this summer? Come one day early and participate in the best hidden gem conference in the United States. Badge Summit 2019 will take place on the Temple University campus in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on June 22nd. There will be lots of wicked smart educators to collaborate with on topics such as digital badges, credentials, gamification, and more. To learn more about Badge Summit, simply visit bit.ly slash badge summit. All right, welcome back to the podcast, friends. So it was Minecraft's 10th anniversary. They've been kind of celebrating it for the last, I don't know, month or so, three weeks. Um, Lots of stuff going on, lots of big announcements. Um, Before we get to some of those... I I wanted to ask you what what is your first memory if you can think about it do you remember the first time you used or played Minecraft um it was my older son Lysander was probably 4 or 5 years old and he had we actually had one of those little iPod touches mm-hmm. and I had Angry Birds on there cuz it was a free game yep and I can't remember what other free games we had on there and then he said, hey, you should buy this game Minecraft. And it was like $5.99, you know, back in the days where you didn't, I didn't buy any games. I just sure. just was playing these free games. Uh, eventually, I broke down, bought the game, and I was watching him play it just on this little tiny iPod Touch. I mean, the little, the little ones. And I didn't get it. Uh, I didn't understand it. Uh, he was trying to explain to me, like, kind of what he was actually doing, et cetera, et cetera, as we go. And then it eventually turned into our typical household video game that we always kind of go back to, which is, it, it's sure. pretty crazy how how much of an impact it's made in, as far as in my life and in my uh, even teaching career. Do you remember the first time you used it at school? Yes. Uh, the first time that I used it at school was a big bust because... <laughs> um, and actually, Connor Crop would remember this. He was like a freshman in high school. And I told him we were going to do it. And I said, it probably something is going to go wrong as far as the technical aspects of it. Sure. Um, and it did because the filter was doing something. So it was a uh, one hour long period and we couldn't get onto it until the last five minutes of class. And they were amazing five minutes, baby. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fine. It's, it's one of those things when you're 
first time trying out tech and and of course they had worked earlier in the day you know how one of those types of things and then now of course it yeah. didn't work couldn't figure out what was wrong with it and i don't even know if we ever figured why why it didn't work at those specific times but later on we we got it to work and uh yeah <laughs> i do remember it was a big fail <laughs> that's pretty funny how about you that's pretty funny so i tell this story every once in a while of the first i remember the first time i played minecraft um and I remember how I felt, you know, as when when night started to kind of creep in, and um, I don't know how I I couldn't I couldn't parse why I was so like terrified and <laughs> and like emotional over a a game uh, of, of with blocks mm-hmm. and 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 voxels, um, and I just I didn't understand the emotions that like, I was like, Oh my God, I gotta, I gotta hide. The zombies are coming. Yep. (laughs) And, and I was legitimately like in, in tranced in, in the moment of trying to like, you know, dig out a side of a hill. Cause I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I didn't know you could chop down. I just like, was like, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to figure this out. I didn't realize, you know, that how you built stuff or anything like that. I just turned it on and then it started to go to night and I'm like, Oh damn, I'm going to die if I don't hide. So I like dug, dug myself into a, the side of a hill. And then I like put, <laughs> I remember putting, dirt back up in front of the hole so because i couldn't build a door i didn't know you could build like yeah. doors and stuff <laughs> so i and then i'm like what do what do i do now because i can hear them yes and i don't want to go outside so I, every and i had to wait for night to turn into day <laughs> and so i was just sitting in the hill a little hole in the hill with dirt in front of me and every every minute or two i would crack open a crack a block look outside see if it's still dark if it's still dark i'd you know fill it back in again <laughs> and i didn't realize you had to wait like 10 15, 15 minutes, minutes yes for, for so i'm like what do i do so i just i just like watched the tv <laughs> while i could hear the oh, um, yeah. in the the noises and stuff um but i was hooked and um you know, and then I started, and then, you know, I have my second screen. So I'm on my second screen going, how do I build things now? Cause I need to figure out how to, you know, do this without having to like bury myself into the side of a hill every night, uh, just to stay alive. Uh, it was pretty awesome. The first time I used it at school was probably in 2014 or maybe, maybe early 2015, but we did, um, I, I, I worked with the grade four teachers, uh, to do uh, a culminating activity where they they used to do this culminating assignment where they made like a giant diorama of a city mm-hmm. using cardboard and building built buildings and streets and like police stations and stuff. It was a unit on like their community and community services and and like the 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 types of structures and buildings and facilities that go into building a community like hospitals and schools and the grocery store and stuff like that. I think it was grade fours. And so I, um, I, I said, why don't we build this in Minecraft instead? So we, we built the whole city in Minecraft and, and built like a grocery store and a jail. They, they had fun building a jail. And then, um, because they knew how to do all this, they built trap doors so that people would fall into the jail and get stuck. So there was a little bit of trolling going on, uh, too, which was really strange. Um, but, but it was a pretty fun experience and I, I was, I was really happy to have done it. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I, I realized I was like, wow, you know, you could do this for anything. Yes. A lot of power in that game. My goodness. So, so yeah, but the, the Minecraft classic, that was a huge thing last week. We could have talked about that. Cause I was like, I can't believe they actually put this out. So, so that blew it us takes away. you right back. eh? Yes. Oof. Yeah. It blew us like away. There's, there's not a lot in there <laughs> <laughs> and, and the control scheme is even different. It's, I forgot. Uh, so much of the way that Minecraft was back in like 2013 and and 14 compared to compared to now, um, you know there there so so you can now play like a Minecraft as if it was like the beta version or alpha version of Minecraft. You can now play that in your browser, which is super sweet. 
It's crazy. Uh, you could play it in basically any browser, which then the first thing that Steve Isaac said and you said was like Chromebooks, yeah. like right yes. away, because that's yeah, a yeah. huge uh, segment. We we talk about like how predominant Chromebooks are in education versus, yep. let's say, iPads or versus having some sort of laptop. Um and so that was very limiting for, a, or is very limiting for a huge population of, pe- of people that want to use this, but they can't at their schools. This is, this is amazing. This is a way to be able to go ahead and use your Chromebook, basically using the browser and then being able to play at least a beta version of Minecraft. So it's, it is limiting. There are a ton of schools that are Chromebook only. They don't have PCs. They don't have iPads. All they have is carts. Or our one-to-one Chromebook. There are tons of these schools. And they're basically shut out of using Minecraft because it doesn't work on a Chromebook. This changes everything. Uh, it's it's You're right, it's not you know the, 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 the prime version of Minecraft. It's not even as good as Minecraft PE or, or anything like that. But it's still a chance for you to build and create and open up a sandbox and allow kids to demonstrate what they've learned using uh, this this exceptional tool. Uh, Chromebook users have been shut out since the beginning, mm-hmm. and and this I think this opens up a ton of doors. It's listen, it's not the best, but it's better than nothing. Yes, and it's free, <laughs> and it's it is also completely free. So you do not need a, a an Office three six five subscription. You don't need anything. You don't need, a, you don't need anything. You need to open up that damn browser, and <laughs> and type in I think it's classic dot minecraft dot com mm-hmm. or dot net. net yeah. And, and and go to town and listen it there's nothing that should be stopping every teacher in the world from at least giving this a go uh in some way shape or form there's nothing to stop you now no excuses people <laughs> talk about no excuses man this minecraft earth the augmented reality game that's going to be taking the world by storm this summer I think it's a big deal. Oh my goodness. I saw it. So I was like, oh, this is, this could be freaking so huge. I hope it is. So, yeah, I mean, it's another, it's another great example of what you can do with AR. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to take a deep dive into this next week uh, for sure, because uh, we don't want to, uh, if we're going to talk, uh, spend a whole show talking about AR, this should be a, a featured position in that um but this is a big deal i think that this could be a whole lot of fun it'll be the pokemon go of 2019 i suppose nice um so we'll see we'll see uh when we come back our friend nate green returns not only to talk again about social media but he comes with an amazing blog post written for on education and we will talk about that next All right, welcome back to the pod, everyone. Nate Green is a technology and instruction specialist from Virginia. He spoke with us on episode 50 and joins us again today to talk about a new blog post up on the On Education website. Welcome back to the show, Nate. Great to be here. So, Nate, you just wrote an awesome blog post for the website about social media and, in particular, students using social media to um, to do research, to learn about the things that they're interested in, and to uh, to um, develop community. And, you know, it's an awesome article, and we need everyone to go and read it, because we're also going to be tat- chatting about it on uh, Chat on Education this week. Um, but we have some thoughts on it that I, I want to kind of touch on. And the first one is this, that teachers have a lot going on. They're They're pulled in a lot of different directions. How important is this, this being engaging students in social media? Uh, how important is it? I think it's worth contextualizing where this needs to be placed in a teacher's priority. It's important. So what I would say to an administrator is it's as important as it is to you for your classes and your curriculum to be connected to the real world. Um, and what I would say to an intellectual yeah. and sort of a larger in a larger scale, is when we look at what's happening with our students with the, the digital footprint that they have and what they're exporting when they apply to colleges and jobs, 
the amount of sort of like bullying and trolling and that crap that's going on in our hallways. Uh, and then you think more broadly about what's crossing our feeds, whether it's, you know, propaganda, misinformation, disinformation, that's causing political polarization and epistemic inequality. And that's all driven by yeah. algorithms and AI uh, at the expense, of course, of our privacy. Um, and not to mention it's drastically changing our economy, whether it's sort of the future of work, we think about like automation or globalization, or it's like, you know, contract freelance work with, with what we're seeing with the gig economy. Um, yes. So, you know, at, on an intellectual level, it is very, very important that we start to understand this stuff and teach this stuff. Um, but again, I could sell it to a school really easily by talking about how this is real world application of the content we're teaching. It's it's it shouldn't need to have to be I, it's boggled. I'm speechless. I don't even know what to say. I sh you shouldn't have to explain it to people like it's it is super important. It's incredibly important that that we understand how this fits into our world. Right. So speaking of this, this importance and, and stuff is that some educators are totally turned off by this they're not interested in this at all what is it about the internet and media sources that turns most educators off is it fear of the unknown uh is it this legacy conditioning you know from back when even i remember when i was in university that you can't use wikipedia as a research source type of thing um how do we move beyond this obviously dated thinking Unfortunately, when I talk a lot about this stuff, I talk to school districts where social media is entirely blocked. Um, so yeah. districts and administrators think that it's all negative and as a result, block it. And that's like the easy way out, you know. And then there's this other problem, which is that we educators and parents, too, we tend to think that our students are digital natives and that they understand that space better than we do. And so why would we go into this space? Like, we, 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 you know, we can't get involved in it. Um, and, and I would put both of those to rest. I mean, our kids are spending all this time in this space. So why would we block it? That seems dumb. And that's yes. directly leading to some of those things I was talking about earlier, like the, the problems we're having with bullying and, and our kids, you know, posting dumb stuff online and then also having these ugly digital footprints for when they, they go out in the real world. And then to the other, to the other point I was making about digital natives, like, yeah, I mean, if you watch a teenager work on Snapchat and you watch their thumbs move, you 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 go, whoa, what, what's going on here? I, I don't get this at all. Um, but then you ask them to turn something in on Google Drive, and then they play dumb, and they're like, I don't, I don't know how to do it. I swear I turned it in. Right? <laughs> so it's a selective problem. Uh, so I, I would dispel with both of those right away, and and then you know, connect it back to my first answer. I mean, this is what's happening out in the real world. As people are learning yeah. online, they're collaborating online, uh, and they're creating and sharing online. Uh, and if we're blocking it out, we're, we're leaving our kids behind uh, for when they leave us and, and move on to whether, you know, I'll be college or, or the real world. So, Nate, Mike and I talk about the perception that every teacher is on Twitter or working within a kind of a globalized professional learning network, when in fact, the majority are really are not. And in the article, you write uh, this quote here, if students want to be successful in their career, they know they have to use social media the way professionals do. They have to be able to connect and collaborate with other learners and creators. Is the first step getting our teachers on social media in a professional sense? I think that is an essential first step. I think that's really important. Uh, let me be clear, though, that uh, not everyone has to do, do, you know, connect and learn online and share online to, to be successful. Sure. There's certainly exceptions to that. Um, but then I think this is how I put it to my students. I say, well, soon enough. Um, my generation, people, you know, I'm in my 30s, right? But those of us are going to take over in these administrative roles, and we're going to be the ones doing the hiring. And when I do the hiring, if I don't see anything online from you that's, you know, creative and, and productive and collaborative and is connected to learning, right? All these things I've been talking about in that article and on this podcast, then I would be less likely to hire you. I'm not saying I wouldn't, Absolutely. right? I'm not saying you can't be successful without social media. I, I'm just saying this is the space where professionals are connecting. And if you're not in it, that raises a red flag with me. Um, so that's definitely on the cusp. That's on the horizon. Um, so absolutely, uh, it is it is a place where we need to get our students so that it can open doors for them uh, after their time with us. And yeah, to your point, it's absolutely helpful to get teachers doing it first. Uh, but as I argue in the blog post, you don't have to be you know a, a teacher that's in a PLN that's talking on hashtags. You don't have to do any of that um, still to make an impact in this space. And I like to start some of my my talks at conferences and at schools with a bunch of like teenager terms like, you know, Finsta or Twitch or, 
you know, yeah. uh, snapback for, for TVH, you know, weird stuff like that. And I go, Hey, you can get every single one of these things wrong and you can still make a major impact in your kids' lives in this digital. Oh, I love just that. Just by, just by you know, embracing it, you know, and starting. So read my blog post because I give you a bunch of tips on how to do that. That's, that's sort of basic and really easy um, to get you started. And, and absolutely we, we gotta be doing it. And there is an easy on, on ramp, if you will. So in, in the blog post, also, you have this amazing quote, and it says, we have to help our students value veracity over virality and creation over spectation. So Nate, what are some ways to get our students working towards this goal? Well, first, give me a little literary license with the word spectation. I, I don't think that's a real word, but you, you know, you know. <laughs> I love it. It is now. Yeah, I love all of it. I was just making sure I pronounced it right. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I, so I, I, there's three things I say in these talks. I say do over don't, right? We do need to tell our kids what they should do rather than what they shouldn't do in the space, right? And, and we're, right now we have that backwards. Secondly, I say we, we need to value veracity over virality. Um, and third is we need to have our kids spending more time creating than they are spectating. Um, and it's really, it's, it, it sounds challenging. Um, but as, as I was saying in my answer to the last question, it's not. There's an easy on-ramp for this. Um, and the key, the absolutely essential piece of it to me is that if we're going to be successful in this, kids have to be able to follow their passions online. Um, so that's what I was talking a lot about in episode 50. So, so go back and listen. Um, but if we want media literate digital citizens with a digital portfolio that will help them in college and beyond. Um, we have to allow them to follow a passion of theirs in that space. That gives us our best chance to succeed. Because if it's something they care about, they can build up a network of uh, experts and groups uh, of, of critical thinkers in, in organizations that put out quality content about a passion. And once they build that network, if they're truly into it, um, what appears in their network um, is veracity over virality. Um, and then the second piece of this is this is what schools are already doing well. They just haven't applied it to the digital space very well, which is we always ask our kids to create, right? We always do. Um, and, and so, you know, our best teachers are the ones that are frequently asking their students to create and are thinking about how students can create for a wider audience than just a teacher. So I, nice. I think we are doing that already. And I'm just saying, uh, let's add that into to social media spaces um, as well. I feel like, I know the answer to this question or what you're going to say the answer is, but I'm going to ask it anyways, because I think it's an important thing to keep saying. What do you think the bigger issue in education is students using social media at school, in particular at times where maybe they shouldn't be, or schools ignoring social media and students not being taught how to be responsible users? And I guess the most important question in this or the sub question is how do we do better on the latter while not exacerbating the former. Yeah, I think you do know my answer, which is uh, <laughs> if we're going to be doing it anyway, we might as well be teaching it, right? Uh, and the way I yeah. put that last time is that Common Sense Media said in 2015, teenagers consume media for nine hours a day. Um, wow. And that's a lot. And I'm going to say, you know, could we change that? Sure, you know, but I'm going to take it as a given. And if they're consuming nine hours of media a day, as their teacher, as a teacher or as a parent, um, what are they getting out of that that sort of I'm proud of and I'm happy about and I want to lean into and I want to ask questions about and I might want to learn about, right? And if that's limited, um, you know, that that seems like a, a area of growth for us and a, a space that we need to enter. Um, so I think that would absolutely be uh, step one. And then, um, it, you know, going back to, to, to blocking, you know, the other, the other option is like, well, let's block these things. Let's discipline these kids for doing this stuff. And, and they're going to do it anyway. Uh, yes. So if we block iMessage, they're going to get on Google Docs and chat there. If we block Discord, they're going to get on Slack. You know, we're just, yes. that's just a whack a mole <laughs> of the time. So, it, so I think at the very least, if you are trying to do sort of damage control, um, I would say that the, the way in which I would do that is I would block something temporarily and then say, let's have an honest community discussion about this. You know, how are we using this? Do we need this? Would you would you prefer it if it were blocked? You know, what, what kind of regulations can we put in place and 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 bring student voice in on this? And, and that gives us our best chance. And just lastly, as a teacher, uh, I think I know where this question is coming from because when I assign homework, I am one hundred percent positive that my students are multitasking when they're doing my homework. And I yes. also know because I st I do the research on this that that is obviously hurting their performance. Like that's mm -hmm. just what science says, you know. <laughs> So 
at the very least, we can start to explain that kind of stuff and say, well, you know, are you sure you want to be texting while you're also doing your biology reading, you know? Fantastic. Um, and so, yes. so having those honest discussions and, and thinking about the science behind learning is another crucial first step into, into helping these kids use these um, different digital tools at the right times and in the right ways to be, you know, productive, to enhance learning, and even to enhance communication, which I think is what you started this question about. So... Nate, as our teachers are listening to this podcast, what are some tips you have for them if they're interested in getting their students started with using social media in their classroom? But I mean, it's such a like a forbidden topic. I mean, it's a, you know, we block it at schools. We don't want to talk about it. We say everything is bad about it. So how do they start using it in their classrooms for professional use or just for, for learning, creating? So if a teacher wants to get started with a PLN and start becoming a better teacher online, uh, he or she should follow you guys and work from there. Um, and, and get on, <laughs> Thank you. I, I like you. <laughs> and get on Thursday. Oh, and just for the record, if you're reading the blog post, I left a section in there for these two guys to collaborate and add to it because I know they're better than, at, than, than I am than I was talking about. I don't know if you guys punted on that, but get involved. Um, anyway, yeah, so if you want to, you know, definitely, you know, dip your toes in by, by you know, starting a PLN yourself as a teacher and getting into it, um, that that's definitely a great first step. Um, but I would say the other the other like fear um, is that we we feel like we don't want to get into the space where students have already claimed as their own and where they already interact. Like, do we really want to get into sort of the Instagram of of our teenagers, or do we want to know what our what our you know middle schoolers are Snapchatting? No. So that often dissuades us from from even thinking about getting involved in that space. And and if we do anything close to it, we usually sort of take that offline and out of those teen spaces. And I get that. Um, so I'd say to that, um, you should definitely be asking your students to split and to have a social social media feed and a school and or professional social media feed, depending on their age. Mm. So definitely divorce um, those two things, which helps keep you out of the space that you didn't want to be in to begin with um, and gives them the students sort of a clean slate, if you will, a new space um, for them to start exploring social media and how it can enhance their learning again a, about a passion of theirs. And then of course I got to plug my website. I mean, social media for sure. Uh, I have a list of like 35 or 40 interests where you, you know, you click it, you click what you're interested in and then it spits back to you, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, podcasts, you know, subscription newsletter, anything um, that can help you learn more about something you're passionate about. Um, so that's how I would help students be, build PLNs. But just to give one last point on this and, and to give away a little piece of the article that you got to go read, um, I think that when we think about syllabi for our classrooms, um, instead of just having the readings that the class is going to do, we should also be giving our kids lists of who the experts are and the organizations that. that are putting out quality content about our areas of interest and our content areas in schools. So that if a kid truly loves your class, uh, he or she can get online and continue to learn about it indefinitely in a space that updates in real time with experts in it that are putting out amazing work all the time who might even hit you back um, and yes. collaborate with you or, or give you an interview or put something up on your website uh, or in your digital portfolio, et cetera. So I'd say that's a pretty basic step. And so when I go to schools and talk about this stuff, that's always the activity I'm doing. I'm like, you know, you don't have to have a, a Twitter presence or, or a Facebook account even at all. Um, to go find the authors that you read to learn about your content, the um, guest speakers that you bring into your class, um, and, and you know any any content they're using from outside. Why don't why don't the students follow it? Because then they can learn about it forever. Uh, and I've done that. And in my contemporary world history class, which I taught a few years ago, I gave my kids a hundred sort of people that talk about international news. And uh, my kids tell me that when things go on, like when the Notre Dame, Dame fire happened recently, they got back on that Twitter feed and went and learned from those people because they knew wow. they would get quality information updating in real time and they wouldn't have to worry about misinformation or, or fake news or any of that. Um, so that can be a source of learning that, that, that it goes well beyond your classroom, uh, which, which so anyway, that, that's always the thing I sort of start with when I say to teachers, like, you know, you know, you know investigate this space a little. So. Nate, your blog post is up now. Uh, if you're listening to this, then you can also head over to oneducationpodcast.com. Check, check out the blog and Nate's post will be there and you should uh, totally go and uh, read that. And we hope that it'll give you uh, a bunch of great ideas on how to uh, implement social media uh, as a teacher, both uh, but also with your students. Thanks for joining us on the podcast, man. Yeah, it was a great time. I always love talking to you guys.
Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Mike Washburn. My co-host is Glenn Irvin. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Glenn is at Irv Spanish on Twitter. I can be found on Twitter at Mr. Washburn. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. We're also on Instagram at oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we'd be thrilled if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or on the Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Classcraft, for supporting us. Check out classcraft.com slash on education to learn more about them. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome. See you soon.